you can keep all your grades from all your exams like in your pocket or with a single identifier, with a single, um, your, your own private key, passphrase, whatever you use to sign in, right? Single identity, right? You move from school to, from one to another, they already know how you were faring. And then you go to university, they already know how you were faring. If you want, um, if you want a, a grant or, or anything like that, this is all in your card, right? And if you graduate, if you have a diploma, well, they do, this diploma can also be accessed from your single unique identity, meaning that it's not a forgery and it's a proof that you can, you can use to later find a job or to change university, to, to do everything that actually require the actual piece of paper. So this is already pretty powerful. Hi guys, welcome to the fourth episode of Blockchain Beyond Hype. Today we're talking with Jean-Daniel Gauthier, aka Danny, one of the co-founders of Blockchain Zoo, about the social impact of blockchain technology. So we are here today with Danny. Uh, we're excited to have you here in Bali as you are usually in Jakarta or on site somewhere around APAC. Um, let's discuss your thoughts on the blockchain and social impact of this technology. Okay, let's do that. So Danny, as a tech and business professional, you are very passionate about startups. Certainly, as you are specializing in adopting blockchain, the majority of projects you deal with are using this technology. Could you explain to us why your choice leaned towards startups and why towards blockchain? Okay, why towards startups? Well, first, I like it lean. And uh, startups, they do lean. Uh, mostly, okay, there is an interest uh, about blockchain from much bigger entities, uh, big corporates, government, but then again, even if sometimes they really want to, there are barriers to actually going to POC real fast. Uh, mostly that's budgeting, but that's also some risk adversity. And there's also, you know, when you're a huge company, I'm gonna say like thousands of people, in order to make something happen, just, just broadcasting uh, a message, broadcasting a change, broadcasting an order, it takes, it takes very, very long. And I like, I like when things are a little bit snappy. So at this point, yes, yeah, startups are good for that. And also, well, sometimes they come up with all kinds of crazy ideas and all kinds of crazy people. And well, these are my people and my ideas, my kind of ideas, I mean. So yeah, that. Okay. So um, why towards blockchain? Why towards blockchain? Yeah, I skipped that, didn't I? So someone once asked me whether I was in love with the technology. Do you love blockchain, right? So first off, no, I don't love blockchain because I can't marry blockchain and I'm already married anyway. What I love is the possibilities. So there was this time, right, when I sent, uh, I sent money to a friend who needed it uh, from Jakarta to some city in France. Uh, it was on a Friday night and he received it in 15 minutes. So this is something I actually helped him because he needed it not to, to buy video games or something, he needed it to eat, right? So I could make sure that my friend could eat in, in the weekend. I would have gone for, for a wire transfer or anything else. It would have lasted at least, at least three days. And that was almost instant with almost no fees. And I thought, damn, like what else can I do that can actually help people with that? You know, I have now, uh, I'm married to a local Indonesian, right? I have family all over Indonesia, including villages and, and remote areas. And I'm thinking, hey, could it actually help? Help me to, for instance, send money to support my family, like up there in the mountain. And I do think it's possible. So your profession may be called blockchain consultant. What does a person in such a profession actually do? What is your job description? I consult about blockchain. Basically, there is a lot of interest about the technology, but uh, startups or, or bigger companies or, or those interested in it, they don't know where to start. Uh, so basically, well, they call people like me and first I need to be a psychologist because I need to know exactly what they want. Then I need to be a teacher and explain uh, what happens. And then I need to link, okay, now you've told me that your goal is A, B, C. Blockchain fits for A and for C. 
I'm gonna show you how to do it. I'm gonna show you the steps. This is, this is what I do. Okay. So there are so many innovation consultants, data integration consultants, digital transformation consultants. Why do we also need blockchain consultants on top of this already long list? This is a good question because, well, something I like to say is you, you, you know orange juice, right? Mm -hmm. Well, orange juice, you know how it's 10% uh, orange and, and all the rest is sugar and water? Sure. Yeah. So right now, a blockchain solution is much like orange juice. You have 10% blockchain and the rest is, is traditional uh, technologies. You need someone who can tell you, who can help you figure out, not tell you, but help you figure out how this 10% is going to fit into your system in a way that's actually accurate and productive. So, yeah. So out of projects you have worked on or consulted on, could you reveal which percentage came to the conclusion that blockchain was actually the technology to use? Uh, I would say, for many reasons, that would be around 50%. Okay. So why are so many businesses looking into this technology despite it not making sense for them? Uh, tourism. <laughs> Okay. So I'm, I'm going to be very, uh, very direct about this. Mm -hmm. It's a new technology. There is a lot of hype. So there are, there are two types of tourists. They're the ones that say, hey, I've heard about ICOs. And uh, so how can I make a lot of money right now? And then I, no, no, you can't. I, I would, no, no. Okay. And, <laughs> and, um, and those would just, you know, I've heard about blockchain. So what can blockchain do for me? But the problem is they don't know their own pain points. And when they realize their own pain points, they realize that blockchain is actually not for them. I won't blame them for trying, right? Because it's, I think it's good in technology to be curious and, and to explore you know, everything that, that comes out. But well, sometimes something is not for you, and th that's fine. Okay. Mm -mm. So what was the simplest yet impactful advice you have given to a company which was about to start adoption of blockchain, blockchain technology? Uh, don't store your users' private keys in a database in clear. <laughs> but beyond that, I think it, it goes, if there were, you know, this one secret, this one secret uh, consultant don't want you to know. <laughs> uh, people would know it already. The thing is, with consulting, we, we have to go through processes to actually extract what, what customers really, really want and really mean. Uh, so it's very personalized. I can say that, that sometimes after, a, after an agile workshop, for instance, uh, a client wanted A, but ended up realizing, realizing that they needed B instead that their wants and their needs were completely different. This period of, of dialogue, very open dialogue, that actually helps, um, you know, help driving change and driving uh, uh, innovation within, within the company. So one of the points I have picked up on is that you are so passionate about this specific technology because of how impactful it is, mm -hmm. how it can reshape societies. I was trying to narrow down spheres of this impact, and these are the few that I came up with. Could you help me bringing specific examples or just explaining the way technology would enable better solutions? So firstly, for educational systems, how attendance rate, scholarships, and tuition fees marks are managed, communicated to all parties involved, such as students, parents, schools, or universities, and funding institutions. All right, so it, it might be a bit tangential to, uh, to your question, but what I'm looking at is blockchain is good at establishing veracity of something, at, at enforcing transparency, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also good at making data portable. So instead of having data which are concentrated in, in one place, which is in one school or in one university, they're with you and you bring them around. So just that, imagine that, okay, first, for, for instance, okay, my, my mother, she, she used to keep all my grades and, and all my, uh, everything that, that happened in school, right? So I, I, I came back home at some point and was like, oh my God, I was in like third grade. But this is because my mom did, 
right? Now imagine that your mom doesn't have to do it. You have it like somewhere in your phone, in a card, in a, in a, in a device, right? That keeps it for you. And you can, you can keep all your grades from all your exams like in your pocket or with a single identifier, with a single, um, your, your own private key, passphrase, whatever you use to sign in, right? Single identity, right? You move from school to, from one to another, they already know how you were faring. And then you go to university, they already know how you were faring. If you want, um, if you want a, a grant or, or anything like that, this is all in your card, right? And if you graduate, if you have a diploma, well, the di this diploma can also be accessed from your single unique identity, meaning that it's not a forgery and it's a proof that you can, you can use to later find a job or to change university, to, to do everything that actually require the actual piece of paper. So this is already pretty powerful. And socially, it's also good because uh, schools can also uh, accredit each other. So if you have a, a good school, right, with, with a good reputation, that's going to accredit a smaller school somewhere in a, in a remote village, right? The accreditation is very valid. And with a system like this, you know that it's not a fraudulent accreditation, for instance. Okay. What about for the coordination of resource distribution among refugees, homeless people, or any other group which require extra help and care from society? Mm. So I think it also boils down at this point to um, the portability of data mm -hmm. and also the fact that, well, okay, take Walmart. Mm -hmm. It has already uh, implemented blockchain solutions for traceability, oh. right? So when you actually have assets that are circulating, I mean physical asset resources that are circulating, it's much easier to track them uh, and much more reliable, much more auditable if you track, th track them with, with a blockchain solution, for instance. So at this point, that could help. But also, uh, when it comes to, you know, if you have certain rights as a refugee, you need to have an identity that, that sticks to this, you know, to this status. Mm -hmm. So that's already uh, another thing that can be done. And also, um, applying for the status of refugee because this is not something, you know, you don't just get into a country and, and get your refugee card. It's actually a pretty lengthy uh, process and it's, it's actually pretty, um, pretty tiring. So at this point, this application could be done digitally in a decentralized manner. So all the organizations that have uh, something to say about this, re uh, this status and all the, um, I'm going to say all the, the, the bodies where this status matters when you need to present this status could have a node on this, on this blockchain. So you can actually, you know, present yourself and everybody can be sure that you are you. Mm -hmm. So that's another way it could help. And lastly, to incentivize all kinds of sustainable practices among citizens, such as recycling, proper waste management, decreasing electricity usage, and so on. All right, so you had me at recycling. Uh, there is one figure that, that uh, is stuck in my mind. It's an old figure from somewhere around 2010, but we actually dumped something like 350,000 cell phones per day, right? And right now, if we were to start mining all used PCBs, you know, circuit boards, mm -hmm. it would be more profitable than actually mining the ground. But we are not doing it. And the reason why we're not doing it is because the logistics behind that are, are very complicated, right? That's the first reason. The second reason is that there is not enough incentive to actually start the recycling process. Now, I'm pretty sure that in your drawer at home, you have one used cell phone that's going nowhere. And I'm pretty sure that, that whoever is listening to this has this cell phone drawer or this cable drawer, this old electronic, dead electronic drawer, and it's, it's not going anywhere. And the day it goes somewhere, right, you don't even have the insurance that everything is going to be recycled as it should. Because when you recycle something, you create uh, an offer, right? Mm -hmm. But locally, there is not always a demand for this offer. So the PCB, it, it can be scrapped for gold, for instance, but it can also be ground 
and transformed into a ground PCB for I think you can make uh, you can make uh, other type of plastic with it but you can also make roads from recycled plastic they are doing it in, in India if I'm not wrong so but who is gonna do it if it's not in your neighborhood or in your city or in the next city you're gonna have to ship it right mm -hmm. but to ship it you need to ship it in the right quantities right mm -hmm. now if you can build a global market for reusable products recycled plastic recycled pcb all the old cable the copper the aluminum and then uh, for the treatment as a service for the treatment of uh, dangerous material like cobalt and and so on and so forth then you're gonna find that people are gonna capitalize on this on this offer and demand on this uh, on this marketplace market prices are gonna start to appear and they are going to attract players in this industry say oh hey i didn't know there was such a demand for recycling in my city i'm i'm going to open a plant but then again the plants can be themselves on the blockchain to actually ensure traceability for refurbishing even so if i if i buy a phone a refurbished phone i know that it's been refurbished by this um by this company at this point that this is actually legit, that the component is actually not too old, but same for same from when you re recycle something. Oh, okay, this is recycled plastic, but I know it comes from that phone and that uh, all the hazardous material has been handled the proper way. And all this gives value to the recycled product. So there is a whole, really a whole industry to be rebuilt on, uh, on recycling that could really use the blockchain. Okay. So do you know any project which actually brought such a massive and socially impactful solution to life? Uh, you're not going to be happy with my answer. <laughs> but not yet, not yet. Because, well, the technology... So first off, blockchain is, is old already. I mean, not as old as the internet, but it's, it's 10 years old. But it's 10 years old for cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is 10 years old. It's very well validated concept but blockchain for everything else we're just starting so there are fantastic initiatives uh, a company called building blocks is doing something with refugee camps for instance uh, there are several initiatives for uh, smart grid and blockchain uh, but this is still at the POC stage uh, for massive change we still need to wait a couple more years Mm -mm. So the market for social good is very competitive. And I use the word market on purpose, as let's be honest, it is a business. Hundreds of NGOs and firms that work in international development compete with each other for public recognition, manpower, grants. And here's the inconvenient question. Is full transparency what they really want? So if I were to talk around it, I'd say, well, you know, in every market there is something that's based on uh, the asymmetry of information and of course uh, secrecy in business is, what is sometimes what makes the added value and of course people, you know, it's not because uh, you're, you're a doctor that you have to be sick so it's fine if they make profit and uh, the truth is there are good actors and there are bad actors everywhere. There are people who want to profit from every situation right these people want to profit from every situation they don't want transparency that's that's clear then again we're talking about technology right technology can make data more transparent can make processes more transparent it doesn't make people more honest so there is a change of um, behavior that's to be expected when you talk about social causes but I think, and this is why it brings us back to the startup thing, you know, I think there is a new generation of entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs that actually are starting to embrace the, the concept of uh, philanthrocapitalism and all this, 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 new, uh, this new way to see money and to see empowerment. And I'm very interested uh, to see where it's going. Well... 
the topic of social impact is so highlighted already that there is a Blockchain for Social Impact Coalition, BSIC, with over 50 member organizations. Despite them joining forces, there is one big obstacle. Corruption is a major problem in development in many developing countries. How do you see blockchain technology overcoming this? Uh, I don't. To be honest, I see people changing. I see people seeing the needs for change. And I'm very much into uh, giving people the agency they deserve in changing their lives, in changing their environment. Because, well, it's, a g it's gonna sound cheesy, but together we can. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm French, just see what's happening in France, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, technology is what you make of it. So, you know, like, technology, it's, it's like a knife. You can, you can hold it by the handle and cook a beautiful and delicious meal for everyone to enjoy, or you can just go around and stab people. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how we approach humanity as humans, right? That's what is going to decide whether we approach technology as an enabler for utopia or for dystopia. Now, I just think I'm gonna have to keep my uh, faith in mankind going for a little while longer if I want to keep on working with technology, but that's, that's uh, uh, a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Okay. If you could pick one change which will occur in our societies in the nearest future because of the mass adoption of the blockchain, what would it be? One change. Yes. The nearest one. The nearest one, I think the nearest one will be the, the start of true uh, digitization. The start of the no paper uh, approach to things. So on the long term, what I like to see, uh, what I would like to see on the longer term is you never have to provide the same piece of information twice, right? The start of this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been very interesting. Um, thank you for telling us about the social impact of blockchain technology. We do like to ask all our guests, how do you envision blockchain changing the world? You will never have to input the same piece of information twice. Okay. I'm repeating it, but, but think about it. Mm -hmm. Think if you are somewhere lost in the mountain and you have a birth certificate and you have a marriage certificate or whatever certificate you need to apply for, mm -hmm. you've given these informations once and then you can go to your nearest point of contact and never again have to go down to the city and to all these offices and all the red tape providing the same information again and again, going through the same processes again and again. And that is gonna change your life as a person wherever you live and it's gonna make things fairer for people in, in ways that we are not even expecting yet. I do think so. And how do you think the market for the blockchain-based solutions will evolve? The market for blockchain-based solutions, mm, that's very interesting. I think we're gonna see blockchains um, act as platforms. So it, it is starting already, of course, with, for instance, Ethereum, with dApps and, uh, and MetaMask. And I think this is the, um, this is the d direction um, the technology could take. So blockchain as platforms, dApps as apps was a single point of entry for all those apps, maybe even interoperable between these platforms. So one identity, many uses, uh, maybe even later in, in how many years, one currency. Uh, I don't know it would be fun or not, depending on uh, what your take is on it. But uh, yeah, you'll, you'll have app stores for blockchains. That's what I see. All right. Well, it's been great to have you here with us, Danny. Um, it's been great to be here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again for sharing your thoughts on blockchain and social impact of this technology. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you for watching, guys. We at Blockchain Zoo are looking forward to bringing our new guest on our next episode.